from this passage of scripture, I want to preach to you today uh, from this subject, subject, the merciful ones, the merciful ones. And then let me break all the rules and give you a thought. <laughs> Just breaking them bad. Oh, my subtitle, God has been good to me. Amen. It'll, it'll come together and make sense as we move forward. Father, bless us now to preach your word. May we do no damage to the word of the Lord, but preach that which become of sound doctrine and gospel. Remove all hindrances to the word. Open our eyes and our ears that we might hear and understand and then apply the word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The merciful ones. By way of introduction, in the eight Beatitudes as given in Matthew, we are climbing the ladder of Christian blessedness. They, they are given in ascending order. On the first rung, we find those who in a humble spirit has recognized and confessed their helplessness and have called upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, for help and salvation. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Amen. Those who realize that in and of ourselves, we're nothing. We cannot save ourselves. The Bible says this even about our righteousness, about all human endeavors to do right things. The Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, as filthy rags. Our, our righteous endeavors apart from Christ is as filthy rags, as a disposable feminine napkin. That's what filthy rags allude to. That's what our righteousness is like apart from Christ. So for those who are watching on television or those who are here, those who are streaming, if you're a good moral person and you don't cuss, you don't lie, you treat everybody right, you, you're very energetic, you're very positive, you're just a good citizen and a good person, we applaud you, but you need Jesus. You need, you need to be born again. See, because until you're born again, you're not. Until you get saved, you haven't been. There's no uh, almost saved, a little bit saved, on my way to being saved. You're either saved or you're not. Do you know that many people will be lost who have lived a lifetime full of good works, kind acts. They had a philanthropic spirit. They gave millions of dollars to good causes. Praise the Lord. You find them on Sunday morning in marches and, and races, and they do a walk for this disease or for that disease. They, 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 they participate in this foundation's work and that foundation's work, and they raise money to, to overturn dreaded diseases, and they're good people. But if they don't know Jesus, they're still on their way to hell. See, Jesus died to save us. Human beings in and of themselves cannot save themselves. This is where secular uh, psychiatry and Christianity parts co company. The secular psychiatrists and even those in humanistic movements believe that man is basically good and that man can save himself, that we need no savior apart from ourselves. And, and you hear these messages in songs and in writings and in literature as we're told in our attempt to save life, to solve life's problems and to handle the difficulties of life, we're told often to look deep within yourself. We're told often to trust your heart. Your heart will 
your heart knows. Well, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. The Apostle Paul says, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. According to the Bible, man was basically good. He was basically good until the fall. After the fall. See, before the fall, God looked at his creation and he called everything good. But after the fall, man became basically evil. Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to them that ask, how much more would the Holy uh, Father give, the, how much more would the Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask? So men, human beings are at our core. Uh, evil, we have to be taught to do good. We need a savior. There are those who have said no one will save us. No one will help us. We must help ourselves. Well, Christ came. Christ came to the earth and died uh, for our sins to save us. The first step of blessedness is realizing that we need help. We need help from an outside source. We need Jesus Christ Amen. to come into our lives and to save us. Many of us can testify to habits, vices, things that we were doing before we met Jesus that we could not stop. Those things had the better of us until Jesus came in. When Jesus came in, you didn't need a 12-step program, a 10-step program. Jesus took the taste of alcohol, took the desire to smoke, took, to, Jesus came in and cured the craving for uh, illegal drugs. Jesus changed, when uh, Jesus changed our heart and our minds toward immorality, toward wicked behavior, toward the club. Uh, some of us had a habit of cussing, we had a, a foul mouth until Jesus came in. And Jesus doesn't wash your mouth out with soap. Jesus wash your mouth out with his blood. Yes. Amen. And now you don't talk like you used to talk because Jesus came in and he made the difference. So it starts with being, realizing that we are all of poverty of soul. Right. We're poor there is um, it's not the working poor. I've talked to you about that. It's welfare poor. It's those who are so poor that they can't do for themselves. This is, the, this is where we got to arrive. We got to get to the point where we realize that we are so poor that we need Jesus and what he did on the cross to be our welfare and to come in and provide for us what we could not provide for ourselves. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven on earth. Once we get to that place, we can walk in God's kingdom on earth. We become kingdom heirs, and we accomplish things. Great things happen because we are poor in spirit. Isn't that wonderful? And, and keep in mind, now, all of the Beatitudes are attached to the last uh, verse, the last clause, the last clause of verse 11. The last clause of verse 11 says, for my sake. All of the Beatitudes are on the behalf of Christ, for the sake of Christ, for my sake, for Christ's sake, because of me. So it's all connected to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, so as we, we move uh, uh, on, then we go to um, um, from being poor of spirit to um, being mournful. We move to being people who look at our heart and realize that we had sin in us and we mourned over our sin and mourn over the sins of the world. And we mourn to the point where God would give us uh, a plan, a strategy to come out of our own sinfulness and 
to help the world get delivered from theirs. Amen? So you, you see the order as we, we move and as we mourn moving up this second rung of the blessedness uh, ladder, we realize that there's much to cry over, much to cry over, and for God to rejoice over because those who mourn, when we become truthfully, truly mournful for our sin, the Bible teaches, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The God of the Bible comes in and comforts us. You don't have to... Uh, be hooked on tranquilizers and, and drugs. You don't have to turn to a suicide. You don't have to re re turn to alternative lifestyles to find comfort. Jesus is a comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Amen. And he takes us out of our mournful state. As we climb to the third rung of the ladder of blessedness, we find those who recognize uh, their helplessness and we, we seek the Lord and we actually well we mourn and then we go to being walking in meekness the Bible says blessed are the meek and, and the, this meekness uh, is something because it gives us the power to stand our ground the meekness is submissiveness to the will of God we, we submit to God's will. We'll meet to his will, but we fight the devil. Some of us, we're fighting, the wrong, we're fighting the wrong battle. We fight God. We fight the Lord's standards of righteousness. We, we hear it all the time now. The world is quick to criticize Christians. The problem, with the, world, the problem with the world today are these hypocritical Christians. Christians think they can tell people how to live. Christians think they can tell people how to do. And when a Christian minister preaches the standards of God, uh, we, we fight that minister and we say that he's wrong. Well, uh, we shouldn't fight God's standards. We should yield to God's standards and fight the devil. Amen. See, uh, amen. When the, when the devil is trying to get you to go against God, don't fight those who try to, keep, to, try to convince you to obey God. They're trying to help you. So we fight, we fight the wrong battle. Well, it's, it's nobody's business what I'm doing. Well, if your brothers and sisters love you, then they're going to try to help you. And, you, and you, want, you, don't want to, you don't want to fight against God. Our arms are too short to box with God. Meekness is accepting that which the Lord allows. And then you make the most of the position that you're in at the time. The meek shall inherit the earth. That is, your earth that you're walking in, the, your life, as God has it laid out for you right now at the moment. You walk in it. You delight yourself in it. You don't get jealous of others. You don't allow envy and strife to dominate you. Praise the Lord. But you make the most of what the Lord has given you and what the Lord is doing in you, and you submit to the will of the Lord, which, which submission to the will of the Lord is, is so healthy. Uh, it causes, it, it gets rid of stress. And nothing is a killer. Uh, few things is as great a killer as stress is. The Lord said in the last days, men's hearts would fail them for fear, anxiety, and for looking upon the things that are coming upon this earth. And so many people are anxious, so many people are worried, so many people are so uptight, people don't smile, uh, people, most people today are, are, are pessimistic and oh, they just don't see the, the glorious things and, and we, we it, it, that's because we're not seeing through God's eyes. When, when you begin to walk in meekness and, and accept the will of God and accept that the Lord of the, the God of the Bible knows what's best and you operate in that Oh my, joy floods your soul. Your, your insides literally relax. Your, your digestive system gets back on track. You don't have to consume uh, 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 Tom's roll age, uh, uh, a constant uh, uh, heart, heartburn and all that stuff. Your blood pressure lowers because you, you have, you walk in the basic understanding that the Lord has my back. You walk, you learn to walk in the basic understanding that the Bible teaches that God won't allow life's rug to be snatched off and under you. That whatever happens, good God Almighty, that the Lord has you 
in his hands. Praise God. What a wonderful way to live. Songwriter said, when peace like a river ascendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, those are contrasting things. Then he says, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Praise the Lord. Isn't, isn't that some place to get to that you can handle whatever life sends your way? Some of us, the Lord is only good when the Lord is doing what we want him to do. Life is only good when life is doing what we want them to do. Friends are, are good as long as they're saying what we want them to say. Jobs are good jobs as long as it's on the job you're allowed to do what you want to do. Everything is good as long as it allows us to do what we want to do. But then the moment there is resistance, pushback, correction, and the like, and then all of a sudden, it's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. Problem. Well, when you walk in the, the meekness, when you walk in this thing, it shows you that, uh, that, that we, we, we learn to accept uh, the will of God. We submit to the will of the Lord, and then we uh, inherit, the meek shall inherit the earth. You make the most of what the Lord has given you. Amen? And you enjoy God's earth rather than merely suffer it and put up with it. How you doing today, my brother? I don't know. Man. What's up, nudin? How you doing? Well, it's another day, another dawn. Good morning. What's so good about it? You're here. That's a good place to start. You're alive. Oh, my. Bible says make no friends with an angry man. You, you, need, you need to dismiss some of these people. They're too mad. Right. They're not happy, and they ain't going to let you be happy. Right. Praise the Lord. Misery loves company. And when I find out that a person is just going to be miserable no matter what, I leave them alone. I leave them to their misery. And you all go on and have a party, and party hearty, you in misery. But I'm going over here to find somebody who's got some sense. Because, see, life is too short. Life is too short. You don't want to spend the days, the, your best, the best days of your health and vitality being miserable. You live long enough, you ain't going to have that health. You won't be able to move and go and do. And I, I wanted to be on record that, well, that, that while I could and when I could, I did. My God, say amen. amen. You better, listen, you, 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 can, you can fight the power yeah. or you can find out how power works. Yes, you, can, you can join all these protesters. They're protesting, they don't even know what they're protesting. It's just, a pro we're going to protest. What are you protesting? Put the mic. What are you, what are you angry about? They forget the talking point. Uh, uh, let, uh, they try to remember. Mm -mm, I'm not joining that group. Amen. No, sir. God's been good to me. Amen. And there's, there's too much. There's just too much to be thankful for. Amen. Just too much. Amen. Say amen. amen. And uh, Thursday night, we talked about the fourth wrong of blessedness. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Let me move quickly, but I'll just say this. One of the great signs of health is hunger. Amen. Parents know that. Amen. When our children or grandchildren get sick, the first thing that goes is their appetite. Right. They won't eat. They won't drink. And nothing is, is as devastating as your child, your grandchild, your baby sick, and they won't eat. You, my, my mama used to tell us, I didn't understand it until I became a parent. She says, son, uh, there's nothing as, as beautiful. There's no sound as wonderful. There's no sight as beautiful as hearing, seeing, and watching your children eat. And we, we were poor going up and looking back on there were times when she didn't get enough, but she made sure we ate. And I didn't understand it until I became a parent. I would rather see Crystal and Patrick eat than to eat myself. And oh, to see, just sit there and watch my grandchildren eat. Music. You must be a grandfather. You lit up. Music. You give them something, they just eat it. And let, get, John's drinking something, you know, he, he drink, and you know, babies, they drink loud. <laughs> music, 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 music. 
music. And don't see something that you know they like. You just buy it and buy it and buy it. <laughs> Parents get on you. My grandbabies, they love that. Uh, the Welch's gummies. So one day, John Patrick left his jacket to the house, and he came back to get it. And I thought John, John Patrick was going to come into the house and get the jacket. <sighs> Wouldn't you know it, John Sr. came in the house. I had every pocket. <laughs> I had Welch's candy everywhere. <laughs> and so his dad, his dad said, this, this, this coat is mighty heavy. <laughs> and so they, 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 they caught me. But you know, it's just, it's just something, it's, it's something, it's something about it. Because when they're eating, they're full. When you're in a healthy relationship with Jesus, you want Jesus, you want church, you want prayer, you want Bible study, you want the things of God. You know, when people fall out with the things of God, that, that's a sign that they've fallen out with the Lord. You don't ever have time for the service of the Lord. You don't, you don't like church members. You don't like church folk. You don't like church stuff. You don't like the Lord. You've lost somewhere along the way. You fell out with the Lord. You better, you better fall back in. When you fall in love with Jesus, you love this stuff. Praise the Lord. I love the things of God. I love the things of God. I'd rather be in church than anywhere. Somebody said one time, I'd rather be in the, this church service than in the finest graveyard anywhere. I thought that was such a stupid statement. I'd rather be anywhere than in, in the finest graveyard. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be in church than in the finest hospital. Who wouldn't? Come on, compare it to something. Compare it to something. That's my <laughs> stupid as God telling his girlfriend, I'd rather be with you, baby, than any man on earth. You ought to quit him. <laughs> Did you see what he compared you to? You ought to quit him. First, you ought to make sure you heard what you, what'd you say? <laughs> That's not a compliment. Popular gospel song, the man said, I'll just say, the, the, the culmination of the song was, I'll just say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. I won't complain is not a praise. Me and my wife got into it one day about that. I said, that song is a complaint. I've had good days. I've had years to climb. I've had weary days. And sleep is nice. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days, I weigh my bad days. Here's the conclusion. So I won't complain. That's a complaint. So one day, one day, my wife fixed a real good meal and I sat there and ate it. And she said, well, honey, how was the meal? I said, I won't complain. She said, <laughs> I said, I told you. I said, I told you. That's a complaint. That's certainly not saying I enjoyed it. I said I endured it. Somebody just lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Period. The closer you get to Christ, the more you crave Christ. The more you crave the things of God. Now, let's look at the fifth rung. Blessed are the merciful. The merciful ones. This one's a little different. Here it is not the things that they lack that are supplied by God. But they are given more of what they have and show forth or they Share it with others. I want you to hear that now. It is not the things that they lack that are supplied by God, 
but they are given more of what they already have and show forth. They share what they already have with others. Here it is not, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It is not a contrast between state of being and lack of possession and needing God to supply something that is missing. But it is showing forth or sharing with others that which God has already shown forth to you. And therefore, as a result, increase that something that you have the more. Oh, it's going to make sense in just a minute. It is not, praise the Lord, showing forth to others that which, uh, it is rather, showing forth to others that which God has already given to you. The merciful ones are not only those who show forth mercy to others, but more to the point, the merciful ones are those who having already received God's mercy. Hallelujah. Now show forth God's mercy to others. And by doing so, causes God's mercy to increase toward them. The merciful ones are people who have already been recipients of God's mercy. See, when you, when you look at it, when you look at this particular beatitude, uh, verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When, when, you, when you look at it, it appears to be saying, show mercy, so you will get more mercy. If you show mercy to others, God will give you mercy. But that is not what the verse is saying, even though that is true. The merciful ones are those who are aware of the fact that they themselves are recipients of God's mercy first. See, every one of us, before we move any further, need to come to the conclusion that God, that we are where we are and we are who we are because the Lord has shown great mercy on us. See, you're not who you are. We're not where we are because we are so wonderful. We're not where we are and we're not who we are because we got everything right. We're not where we are. We're not who we are because we dotted every I, crossed every T, and looped every L. But we are who we are and we are where we are first and foremost because the Lord was merciful to us. See, it's got to start right there. You, you, you got to say that the Lord has had mercy on me. Everybody who realizes that you are a big time recipient of God's mercy, begin to praise the Lord for his mercy. His mercy, his mercy. Amen. Mercy. Praise the Lord. Mercy. Mercy. We did it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Guilty. Messed up. Fell short. Mercy. And instead of the Lord applying the appropriate penalty. No, he didn't look the other way. God doesn't look the other way. God looked at it and still showed mercy. Mercy. 
See, even when you cry out against sin, you still have to be aware that even as you're standing and crying out against sin, you're still the recipient of God's mercy. The adage, the adage, this is why I preach Bible, the adage that you're to pull yourself up by the boots, your, boot, your own bootstraps, mechanically and ergonomically, that is impossible. You can't grab your bootstraps and pull yourself up. Amen. Now you can pull yourself forward. You may pull yourself over and fall on your face, but you can't stand up holding your own bootstraps. Not unless you got the longest bootstraps in the history of man. And I know that all of us have worked hard and, and have applied ourselves, but you can't assume that your effort is the major reason that you are who you are and where you are and that you're the born again person that you are today. The reason the Bible gives that we are not consumed. Lamentation says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. So we are who we are because the Lord has had mercy on us. See, the Bible says when you see your brother overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, go to them in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest you also be tempted. See, when you have this meekness and mercy in your mind and in your heart as you minister to others, as you live around others, as you interact with others, it keeps you from developing a holier-than-thou attitude because, amen, thank God for you being who you are, but it is because of the Lord's mercy. How many know it was grace? How many know it was grace? By grace are ye saved. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, when, when you begin to understand this, see, it, it helps you when it comes to uh, not holding grudges. It helps you when it comes to not writing someone else off. It helps you when it comes to uh, not pronouncing judgment because none of us got saved when we first heard the message. None of us came around, praise the Lord, fast enough for somebody. Praise the Lord. There's always someone who was hoping that you'd get saved sooner than you did. Amen. There's always a time period between the time the Lord first opened the door and the time we walked in it. Mercy. And then, and then there is that which God exercised in our lives before we heard the message. Mercy got you out the club. Mercy and grace kept you from uh, getting killed as a drunk driver. Mercy, praise the Lord, was on that bullet and it kept your, kept your name off that bullet. It got somebody else who ran out of mercy, but it didn't get you because the Lord showed mercy on you. He had mercy before we asked for mercy. He demonstrated grace before we even called on him. Yeah, he did. And now watch me walking, watch me walk on thin ice since you've been saved. Since we've met Jesus. Since we've been born again. We've still needed and have had and have been the recipients of and are in need of God's mercy. I 
Talking about the merciful ones. See, when you view your life this way, it helps you in dealing with others. I just don't see how so-and-so could be that stupid. I just don't see how they could mess up like that. But you saw how you did. Hey, hey, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? Oh, we, we bear the marks of our indiscretions. The proof of our years of, of not making wise decisions. Sometimes live on. Sometimes they're 30, 40, 50 year old children. Sometimes it's a scar. Sometimes, praise the Lord, it affects your standard of living because of bad decisions you can't get but so far. But through all of that, God somehow touched you and raised you up and made you somebody. Praise the Lord. We are merciful ones. Now, now the question becomes, the question becomes here, how is, how do you realize that you are a recipient of mercy and then not show mercy. See, when you understand it, when you understand it, the first thing it forces you to do is show it. Because you can't understand it and not show it. You can't be aware of how good God's been to you, how merciful the Lord has been, and then not show mercy uh, to someone else. How, how am I doing? Yeah, praise the Lord. James, uh, the chapter 2. I'm going to speed it up because you all don't like this kind of preaching. James, James 2 and 12 says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Thank God the law of liberty is the law of grace. For he shall have judgment without mercy. For he shall have judgment without mercy that show no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Judgment here is justice. You will have, praise the Lord, you, the Bible says you will have, you will get what you deserve. Without mercy, in its full measure, if you show no mercy. But what mercy does, mercy stands up against justice. What do I mean by justice? God would be just to have killed you for what you did. God would be just to have allowed the consequences of our bad choices to affect our lives without a filter. God would be just to have allowed every one of us to get wiped out when we didn't do right, but the Lord showed us mercy. Now, now after God has shown you mercy, the, the way to, to get mercy and, uh, and not to have the Lord to deal with you in a merciless way is that you have to show mercy to others. You all are not standing up now. Bible says in Proverbs 21 and 13, whoso stoppeth his ear to the cry of the poor, he shall also cry himself, but shall not be heard. That's what happens when you show no concern for others who struggle. I don't care how high you may be par perched on your tree. Life knows how to bring you down. For there are some things money can't pay for. There are some things money can't buy. So you have to be careful. I wish I had a prayer in church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15, and keep in mind now Jesus is talking to those who had already received mercy because Matthew chapter 6 is a part of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples according to verse 1 and 2. He said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men, their trespasses. Neither will your heavenly father forgive you your trespasses. And notice, he didn't say your heavenly father will forgive you when you trespass. Or if you trespass. No, you you're going to trespass. We have trespasses. Say, no, well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of anything I've done wrong. That's called something wrong with your mind. 
you have trespasses. We all have trespasses. There's no, there's no person who has no trespasses. Now, people may not know your trespasses. You may not be aware of your trespasses. All trespasses are not overt. Some of them are covert. All trespasses are not trespasses of things of commission. Sometimes they're trespasses of omissions. Amen. Now, sometimes, sometimes they're not visible to the human eye. But God knows us. And he says, if you can't forgive others, if you can't. See, nothing ought to motivate you to let that thing go. Nothing ought to motivate you to forgive somebody. When you figure out that as you point your finger and you, at them, and, you're, and, and listen, 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 what's implied here is that they did it. So you got to get, get what I'm saying now. Northington, it's a, the, the implication is they're guilty. I'm, I'm upset because of what you did. And they did it. They did it. They did it. They did it. They were guilty. And the, and the Lord said, even with that, you still got to forgive men because there are three fingers pointing back at you while you point at them. And those three fingers pointing back at you are the fingers of God pointing at all the things you did. And if you can't let go what they did, God says, I won't let go what you did. Ch changes everything, doesn't it? I'm just, I'm just gonna hate them. I'm just gonna hate them. Well, all right, all right, but you're gonna hurt yourself. Praise the Lord. And you're gonna hurt yourself in more ways than one because even if you hate them, that doesn't mean that God will share your hatred. See, that's, 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 this is the funny thing about uh, uh, forgiving and mercy and stuff. See, you may hold a grudge against an individual, and they may be guilty. You may hold that grudge for a lifetime, but you may hold that grudge alone because that person may get right with God. And the Lord put that thing in the sea of forgetfulness. And God just take them up, 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 up. And there you are sitting there mad, 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 mad. Waiting on the Lord to give vengeance when the Lord didn't forgave the thing because the person got right with God. You're the one now who needs forgiveness. The theological argument is which son was the prodigal son? We think that the prodigal uh, was the one who wasted his substance in riotous living. Oh, I feel like preaching. Uh, the, see, the word prodigal, uh, the root is progenity. It is, it is uh, to waste, to throw away. So one man had two sons. The youngest one came to his father and said, give me my inheritance. And... Uh, that, that I have coming to me. You talk about entitlement. And so his daddy gave it to him. What did he do? He did what entitled people do when they come into something that they're not entitled to. He blew it. He blew it. He blew it. He spent the money. He, the Bible says he wasted uh, the money on routiest living. His life became one great big party. Party! And after he spent all the money, a famine hit. And that man ended up in uh, the hog pen, a Jew. And almost, almost ate the husk that the swines did eat. Almost ate hog slops, slops in his hand. And, 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 and while getting ready to eat the hog slops, common sense came. And he said, wait a minute. Uh, in, my, in my father's house, my, my fathers have slaves who won't, don't eat this stuff. Uh, I'm going home to my daddy's house. And I'm going to tell my father, father, I'm no longer wor worthy to be your son, but if you would just make me a hired servant, if you would just give me a job uh, in the stable somewhere, I'll be satisfied. Ah, uh, but when as he approached his father's house, Bible teaches that his father saw him coming. 
And, uh, and when he saw him coming, the father met him halfway. And the father didn't meet him mad with him, but he hugged him. And put a ring on his finger. Put a cape on him. And then he said, go and kill the fatted calf. Because my son who was lost, now is found. My son who was blind, now he see. And the father said, let's celebrate. And uh, they threw a great big celebration party. Ah, uh, but the oldest son, this is the prodigal, this is, this is the true prejudity. Instead of joining the party, he stood over in the corner mad. He wouldn't celebrate. He, he got upset. So the dad finally looked at him. Uh, he tired of seeing that ugly expression on his face. Dad went to him and said, son, what's wrong with you? And his oldest son said, father, I have never left you. Father, I've served and you've never thrown a party for me. And the daddy looked at him and said, son, you should feel the way I feel. Your brother was lost and now he's found. Your brother was blind, but now he see. And we are celebrating the return of your brother. And by the way, everything I have is yours. You've been living in my house. You got everything I have. Well, the, the younger boy, he was guilty of throwing away money. That was prodigious. But the oldest son, he was guilty of throwing away his relationship with his father. How can you be in your father's house and live with your father and work with your father and not pick up your father's spirit? How can you be close to your father and waste that relationship? Some of us are in the church, but we've thrown away our relationship with the Lord because we don't rejoice to see somebody get right with God. We don't rejoice to see them get themselves together because we'd rather see vengeance than mercy. But I'm telling you, when you grow in the Lord, you would rather see them get right. You would rather see them get delivered. You would rather see them come out because your mind goes back to when you were down, when you were bound, when you were in trouble. What did the Lord do? He picked you up and he turned you around. He placed your feet on a solid foundation. Aren't you glad that God had mercy on you? If you're a recipient of his mercy, lift your hands and say, yeah! Let me close here. So I heard, heard Peter when he came to Jesus and Peter was trying to be generous. He came to Jesus and said, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother that sins against me? How often shall I forgive him? And shall I forgive him? Uh, till seven times. See, the rabbis taught that you should forgive someone at least three times per day if they sin against you. So when Peter came and said, should I forgive him seven times? Peter thought he was being generous. But Jesus said to Peter, I say unto you, not seven times, but until 70 times seven. That is not the literal 490, but an indefinite number. That is you ought to forgive him for as many times as it takes. And then Jesus said, I didn't get an amen then. And then Jesus said, therefore, hallelujah, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king 
which made an account of his servant. And when he had begun to reckon, he brought him in. When he went over the books, he found out that his servant had been embezzling, had owed him, had stolen from him 10,000 talents. In today's uh, value, it's a million dollars. The servant had skimmed a million dollars. He had, praise the Lord, he embezzled it from his boss. But for as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, sell him, sell his wife, sell his children, sell everything that he had until payment can be made. And then after you sell everybody, if it doesn't come up to a million dollars, throw them all in jail and leave them there until I get my money. But I had that servant say, said the servant called on his Lord. The, uh, the servant therefore, he fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Look at this. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him of his debt. He said, you know what? I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to have mercy on you. I'm going to forgive you of everything that you owe me. But that same servant, now he's forgiven. Now he's free. Guess what he did? He went out and he rejoiced and he had mercy on everyone else. No, he didn't. He went out and he found his fellow servant who owed him, good God Almighty, one a hundred pence, owed him just a little bit of money, owed him a small amount comparison to, in comparison to the million dollars that he owed his master. And instead of having mercy on him, he grabbed him around the throat because it was common in biblical times that if somebody owed you, you could grab them around the throat and harass them. He grabbed him around the throat, began to shake him and said, give me my hundred dollars. Now he forgot that God had just forgiven him of a million dollars. Wow, I feel my help here. And when the master heard that that servant didn't forgive his fellow servant, the master called him back in and revoked that mercy. Saints, it's time to forgive everybody because if you don't, then the Lord will hold all of our sin against us. Do you want God to hold your sin against you? The answer is no. So forgive everybody. Let it go. Throw it aside. Thank God that he brought you out. Thank God that he delivered your soul. Do I have anybody here who will praise him for bringing them out, for setting you free, for delivering your soul? Woo! And if, if the Lord brought you out, if the Lord forgave you, and he did. If the Lord saved you, and he did. If the Lord washed you clean, and he did. How do you justify holding what you're holding in your heart against anybody? Well, pastor, you don't know what they did. Couldn't have been any worse than what you did to the Lord. Because the Bible declares 
all men guilty of sin and worthy of death. There is none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. Just understanding this beatitude would settle so many grudges, so much strife, so much family divisions, so much junk that go on in the service. It opens the atmosphere for greater healings. It opens the atmosphere up where when we have service, you can pray for folk and folk get delivered because you know, uh, you, you, you won't look at the person and hope that God don't deliver them. Because what they did, uh, you upset about it. So here they come looking for deliverance and there you are sitting there saying to yourself, now what is he on the altar for? What did he think God going to do for him? What he did for everybody else? What he did for everyone else? Amen. You don't like this today. This one, this one, is, this one is not a barn, a barn burner, but it will change your life because you don't want to live your life holding grudges. And then it says, the merciful who show forth mercy, they shall obtain. That is, it causes God to increase his mercy on the one that show forth mercy. So if you want your mercy bank account to just be overrunning and overflowing and mercy in advance, mercy in abundance, for when you're going to need it, show mercy to someone else. See, but if you show no mercy, your account is empty. And, and, and you, can't, you can't do wrong now. You, you, can't, you can't drive 56 and a 55 miles on because you have no mercy. Praise the Lord. You have no mercy. See, but if you've forgiven, amen. Your bank account is full. Glory to God. I want to be a merciful one. In this day where you know the civil discourse has, has hit the bottom, we're mad and we're fussing and we try to find Bible to justify our unbiblical behavior. God is saying simply this, let it go. But, 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 no, let it go. But you don't know what they did. I don't have to. God knows. He still says, let it go. And sometimes letting it go is not as simple as letting it go. See, the decision to show mercy is not a one-time decision. It's a daily decision. Until it's just cemented in your spirit. Yes. So the, the, whoever you're showing mercy toward and you see them again and the resentment comes back, you don't look at them funny. You look at your resentment funny. Because you ask your resentment, what are you doing here? What gives you the right resentment? Resentment will say, well, what they did, but I've already decided to forgive them for that. So why are you here? See, you attack the resentment. See, that's what's not just. And after a while, the resentment won't come back because it's done. I'm when I talk to the Lord, when I talk to the Lord, I'm glad that I'm, I don't talk to a God who harbors resentment toward me. Because, see, uh, uh, see, see I, I need him. And, and now, I tell you what, when the air needs to be cleared, God has a way of letting you know that. A conviction comes in. And then you deal with that. You, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Oh, God, give me strength not to go back that way again. God, give me power not to do that. Lord, you see. God, you know. And, and you know when you prayed through. Because even in your prayer life, the atmosphere, the surroundings, 
how you feel in your spirit changes. You know then that the Lord has wiped that clean. But you can't, you can't do that and then get off your knees. And there's that person over there. And you're still upset with them. You can't do it. You can't do it. I mean, you can, but when you do, he's going to bring back what he just forgave you for. And it's going to have an adverse effect on you. I want his mercy. And I don't want to be a loser in the game of life. Losers in life are people who live their lives full of resentment, full of anger, full of get evenism, full of just sitting and waiting, waiting for the vengeance of God. It's Nineveh. And Jonah, and Jonah prayed that judgment would come. He wanted them Ninevites to be killed because they were some wicked folk. And, and, and while waiting on God to bring judgment to them, the Lord let the tree he was under dry up. And, and, and Jonah got upset because he lost his shade. And, and, and God says, you have more mercy. You have a greater concern for a shade tree than you do this nation of people. So now you go and you preach. And instead of God's vengeance, the Lord revived the Ninevites. You, you can't, I don't care what anyone has done to you. You can't secretly sit there, well, I'm just going to wait because God's going to get them. I ain't got to do anything. I'm just going to wait because God, God's going to get him. God is going to get him. I don't care how long it takes. I'm just going to wait because something's going to happen. Only, only thing about that is something may happen to them. It may. I don't know. But I do know this. Something has happened to you. A preacher got so mad with Donald Trump the other day with the president that the preacher started cussing. So I said to him, I, I, I said, brother, <laughs> you, you upset with this man, but do you see what's happening to you? So now, whether you agree politically or not, all elected officials, all, you know, the president's they're going to they're gonna either be in for four years or eight years if they live. But, you know, as a saint, you, you know, you, you, you want to, when their reign is over, you still want people to believe you're saved. The Bible says that you be not overtaken with evil. You be not overcome with evil, but you can overcome evil with good. You can't become that which you loathe. You're so mad, you, 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 you're so mad with the person that you're going to cuss the person out. Well, now you become, you're so mad with the person for cussing that you cuss them out. You're so mad with the person for lying that you tell a lie on them. You're so mad with a person for being vindictive that you practice vindicate. You, you practice vengeance on them. The difference between the blood of Jesus, the Hebrew writer said, and the blood of Abel, is that Abel's shed blood cried out for vengeance, the Hebrew writer says. But the shed blood of Jesus Christ cried out for mercy. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Tough altar call today. Preacher, pray for me that God gives me strength.
to be a merciful one. I don't want to just walk in his mercy, but I want to show forth his mercy. In so doing, I build my mercy bank that I have it in abundance when I need it. Anoint me, Lord, to be one of your merciful ones. Come to the altar. Mercy. Glory to God. I told you, this is, a, this is not the easiest thing to come to the altar for. Mercy. Merciful one. I want to show forth mercy. I'm going to challenge resentment when it rise up in my spirit. I have no right to harbor it if I've decided to forgive. No person has a right to harbor resentment that they've said to the individual that I forgive you for. Wait just a, min a minute or two for others to come. I hate white people. I hate black people. I hate all Chinese people. I hate all Asians. I hate Hispanic people. You got you can't you can't hop, you can't carry that. Well, let me tell you what they did to them. First of all, all of them didn't do it. Number two, if what you're saying is so, you still got to let it go. Would there be another? As I make ready to pray, say, well, I'm just going to stay at my seat because I don't want nobody to know that I'm wrestling with this. No, you got to come to the altar. Got to let them see you. <laughs>